Okay, now the author is really getting to the point of the matter. Again, we're in Bishop List, formation of the apostolic succession of bishops, in ecclesiastical, what is it, hierarchy? Um, anyway, that's by Robert E. Williams. And I'm now reading from his part two, page 45. And I'm just going to read it because this is the point that he's getting at. See, the whole departure of this book, and I was looking for this for ages, trying to find something like this. Did anybody just chart the history of the rise of this group of people who call themselves the one true faith that finally came under Constantine? Because the history doesn't show any such thing as what the Roman Catholic Church claims for an unbroken line from Peter. First of all, I've already covered the fact that the Bible doesn't say anything about what happens after the last apostle dies. If there was supposed to be a successor to Peter or John, who was really the rightful last apostle, then John would have had to say something in Revelation. I've shown you that the meaning of succession in the culture and the days that the Bible was written meant a will by a testator who died. And we do have that language in the Bible. It's in Hebrews 9. But it doesn't appoint any successors. The closest thing to an appointment of successors is a group vote by the local church in 1st and 2nd Timothy, and the principle of that is in Ephesians 4, 12 through 16. So even the misuse of Matthew 16, 18 by the Catholic Church would have only applied to Peter, not to any successor. They're using it wrong. It wasn't about Peter. Christ was saying, Epitaute te petre, meaning he's pointing it. Hear, hear me hitting? He's hitting his chest when he says it. It's a very common way of talking in Greek that you see it, you know, when people are pointing at their chest. All right? Christ is going to build the church on himself, nobody else. But even if you pretend you didn't know the Greek and you say he gave it to Peter, okay, there's no succession to Peter. Peter died. There would have had to have been a provision in writing, because that's what succession meant in those days. A provision in writing, as I've gone through to show you the background in this book here. So now he's getting to the rub. How did Christianity develop this idea? They don't develop it out of the Bible. Okay? They don't even try. They're developing it out of the culture. So here we go. The New Testament, Ignatius and one Clement, contributed to the ecclesiastical concept of apostolic succession of monopiscopy in diverse ways. They contain no complete concept of such and no bishop list. They record in separate developments the emergence of all the constituents of the concept. One common element has, a relevant, has relevance to later use of Episcopal succession, the rise of both monoepiscopacy and the succession concept occurs in the internal crises in the earliest periods of the church. An overseer, a term preferred for its connotation of function in contrast to bishop with its connotation of office, emerged naturally in house churches. From such overseers, or elders, as they were often called, there was at least some case, case, there was at least in some cases, an overseer for a city whom we shall term monepiscopas, to distinguish this person from a single leader in the house churches, appointed by apostolic design at the departure of the apostles. Such a city overseer also arose apart from apostolic design, not necessarily against it, in various connections with the death of James, the monopiscopal leader 
of the Jerusalem church. A succession of bishops was perhaps first suggested in Jerusalem at the time of the Jerusalem Council among Jewish Christians with nationalistic hopes by James' kinship to Jesus in the Davidic line. The succession of bishops arose in Rome from Jewish Christian interpretation of apostolic plans in reaction to erosion of established presbyterial authority. These developments set the stage for initial use of succession lists in internal crises rather than dialogue with Roman Greco-Roman society. Let me see if I can increase the size of that here. There we go. That might make it easier to read. I'm sorry that it's, you know, um, gray on gray. That's Google's new color scheme. It's not very readable anymore. It used to be much sharper. Okay, let's see if I can get the... Hello? What's the next page I'm allowed to view? Okay, well, they skipped some pages. All right, let me read it, and then I'll come back. Okay, again, he gets into etymology, which is really important because these are the words in the Bible. Okay, so you have to deal with what the words meant in the Bible to derive any kind of claim for authority. All right? So here we're on page 50 now. I'm going to start reading. The distinction to be made between the two terms of leadership is that between a personal status and an institutional office. With its attendant meanings of advanced age, the term elder signifies the honored men, the outstanding normative figures within the congregation. The term bishop overseer by etymology of episcopas is an established term for office, a term of very general and neutral, entirely non-sacral origin and nature. If we wish to know more about the elder appointed overseer than simply the fact of office, we must look beyond the term itself. Okay, so now he's going to get into the Bible's use. You know, if you're going to say that you have the right of a hierarchy, any kind of ecclesiastical hierarchy, you're going to have to base your authority on the Bible. So that's what this guy starts to do. And he's doing it because he's trying to find where they get it from. Acts 20.28 20, indicates the function of an overseer as far as New Testament evidence takes us. Overseers are to shepherd the church of God. Paul thus describes the overseer metaphorically as a shepherd responsible for sheep. Now think about that. That's your flock. The shepherd image reinforces the overseer's permanent superiority over the congregations. If being an elder suggests that deference is paid him by the congregation from recognizing his dignity, being an overseer then suggests that authority is exercised over the congregation by the person in certain certain areas of responsibility. The area of responsibility intended by Paul in this instance of Ephesian elders is protection of the congregation from false teachers, both from without and from within, verses 29 through 30, the gospel of the grace of God, the kingdom, the whole purpose of God, which Paul never hesitated to proclaim to them, will be perverted. The overseers are expected to be teachers in the specific sense of defending his doctrine against those coming to alter it. At the same time, his focus is not mainly on doctrine. It is on the member of the congregations, the flock, the church, the disciples. The role of these overseers is well summed up in the term shepherds and teachers. And that that's that's a by in the Greek it's a Granville Sharp rule. It's not really shepherds and teachers, it should be it should be shepherds hyphen teachers. Go look up Granville Sharp rule, so you'll know. You have to look up the Greek. There's no definite article between them. 
found in the letter of Ephesians, Ephesians 4.11, which subsequently circulated throughout through the church to which Paul had been referring. See, it's plural, shepherd teachers. Now, think about that. Shepherds have a flock. Okay? So you have a bunch of shepherds with a bunch of flocks, and each shepherd is over his own flock. Now, in our case, we're the sheep. We choose who our shepherds are going to be. That's the difference. A word of reservation is now in order. We have been examining Paul's characterization of overseers and his intention of their role. This is not a description of what the elders necessarily succeeded in doing as overseers subsequently in the Ephesian congregations. The account strongly suggests by the emotional outpouring on Paul by the elders, Acts 20, 37, 38, that the latter individuals agreed wholeheartedly with Paul's appraisal of them and of their responsibility as overseers. It just as certainly does not mean that the Ephesian congregation submitted to that form of authority. In fact, Paul seems to anticipate defections. We therefore conclude that Paul promoted the governing by overseers in some congregations threatened with disunification from external and internal troublemakers from Paul's viewpoint. But that these overseers were not necessarily submitted to without reservation by their congregations. The subsequent situation in Titus seems to mark a further stage of church leadership, conceivably developing from such difficulties as were in anticipated in Acts 20. Paul left Titus in Crete with the responsibility of appointing elders elders, presbyteroi, in every city. In this context, then, a list of qualifications for an overseer as God's steward follows. Campbell proposes that this overseer is an elder appointed to oversee all the house churches in a city, a minus picopas, from those elders in each city, each of whom oversees a church in his or her household. Titus is to choose one as overseer of all the congregations in the city. This overseer will be required in each city to teach the apostles' doctrine and defend it in the face of adversaries. Such a need is envisioned in light of difficulties which have developed similar to the first two anticipated in Acts 20. There Paul warned the overseers in pastoral terminology to shepherd the church because fierce wolves would come, not sparing the flock. These concerns have materialized in some, especially those of the circumcision, are upsetting whole households by their teaching. Now, stop to think about that. The context is the Judaizers. The context are people who do not believe, okay, that the law has changed. People adhering to the old not the new. People adhering to the Judaizers. Not what Christ wrought and the change due to Christ. Okay? So the context of these other overseers is basically a clearinghouse or coordinating to make sure that what? Confirmation to the Bible conforming to the Bible is going on. So who's really the authority still? It's the Bible. That's what those overseers were charged with doing while Paul was alive. And they're in each city. There's not somebody over all of the cities. They're per city. Paul is still the apostle. They're not apostles. They're overseers. Paul's statement, now I'm reading again. Paul's statement from, of the elder's worthiness of double honor sheds light on the role of the monispicopas. 
Titus 1, 5 through 7 evidently records the apostle's desire that an overseer be chosen for each city's group of congregations. And then he gets into, you know, what, what the scholars are saying about what this is. Okay. Then involves not only his family, but also the congregation meeting in his house means not only that one needs to be a successful parent to sponsor a church at one's house, but one must be an effective leader of the congregation at his house in order to care for the congregations in his city that will need outside assistance. You getting the scope of this? It's not talking about a pope. It's not talking about an apostle. It's talking about a kind of coordination so that everybody's on the same page with the doctrine within a city. So if you were to argue an ecclesiastical hierarchy of any kind, it kind of have to be limited to the city. Okay? The trouble, you know, and I'm, I'm commenting here on what they're saying, the trouble with this approach is that when Paul dies in 2 Timothy, He's not talking cities anymore. He's talking about individuals of individual congregations that the congregations elect. This whole city thing is is not mentioned. So you have to you have to ask yourself whether or not there really is a citywide organization that's intended to outlive Paul. The overseer of the city's church of God is responsible to direct in preaching and teaching, but also in adjudicating charges made against the elders. Ah. Okay, so that's like a system of checks and balances. Care requires that charges be submitted by two or three witnesses, and the correction, if required, be done without favoritism or partiality. Okay, so now you've got a city with a bunch of churches in it that have this sort of like a check and balance or sort of juridical high if there's one problem between, you know, the elders in church A. How do you get that adjudicated since we're not supposed to go in secular, you know, to secular courts? How do you take care of that? So there's some justification for, and a lot of churches today have it some kind of city superstructure. I don't see it in Second Timothy, so I don't see where it outlives Paul, but you know, you can argue that based on this text. Okay? This role, particularly with sorry it's so slow. Mention of adjudication implies subordination of the house church overseers to the manuscopas. Perhaps at this stage of development, the collective term elders came to be applied to overseers of the house churches. Such citywide responsibilities dramatic development in the role of overseeing. It involves a single Christian leader in a city, suggestive of the second century manuscopotas in Ignatius letters. Furthermore, it indicates an appointment of the overseer by one of apostolic authority, albeit delegated. Now, see, there's where you go. Look. Appointment of the overseer by an apostle. Okay, so if the apostles die out after Paul, if he's the last appointed apostle, if you don't have somebody who's seen the risen Christ, then you don't have anybody able to appoint an overseer of a city. You see that? The jurisprudence is gone. If there are no more apostles, and Paul says he's the last one in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 10, and if there was anybody left who was supposed to, you know, succeed John, then John would have had to name somebody in the Bible. There's no doctrine in the Bible about any apostles after John. Paul's the last one appointed. Okay, so then there's no way to appoint an overseer. Such apostolic initiative suggests apostolic succession. Okay, but 
the criterion for being an apostle is you have to see the risen Christ, and he has to personally appoint you. Remember from the earlier part of this section of video, you know, these video increments on this book? Succession had to be in writing or personal by the one who died, and that's Christ. He appointed all the apostles personally. He appeared last to Paul. He appeared to James and then to Paul. He didn't appear to Matthias. He didn't appear to whoever that other guy was that Peter tried to substitute in Acts, well, was it one or two? God didn't appear to them. They aren't apostles. But he appeared to James and he appeared to Paul. And that was the last guy. Paul says, I'm the last one. And there's no language in John that, that says, provides for any successor apostle. So, where's the juridical basis for this in the Bible? If there was an apostle, yeah. And then that apostle would have to appoint the overseer. Okay, but there's no juridical basis for the apostle. The current Pope of the Roman Catholic Church would have to testify that he saw the risen Christ. And how are we going to prove that? And then additionally, he's really still not a successor because he's just speaking from his own mouth. If he doesn't line up with Bible, and the Roman Catholic Church doesn't. Neither do most denominations who claim apostolic authority. I can't even think of one. Anybody claiming apostolic authority is going to have to tell you that he saw the risen Christ and was appointed personally by Christ. Okay. And then, to prove whether he's right or wrong, everything he says has to line up with Bible. Okay, where is it? You're not a successor if you don't have doctrinal loyalty to the Bible. We covered that already in, in this session of videos on this book. And that's, of course, you know, obvious from common sense. Okay, so, one Clement is a cat, cat echo, a usurpation. He's claiming authority over the Corinthians. But Paul in Corinthians told the Corinthians that he was the last apostle. So where's one Clement getting his justification? Clement is writing from Rome. The Corinthians are in Corinth. That's not a, he's not a local pastor. He's not local to them. They're not even in the same city. So all of this is not being obeyed, even if it were a valid doctrine. And it's only a valid doctrine if an apostle appoints the overseer. Okay? So the basis of epis, ep, Episcopal authority, see? What authority do the overseers have? From what do they derive their authority as overseers? Okay? From the Spirit. Yeah, well, anybody can claim me speaking from the Spirit. How do you know? Matthew 7. From the fruits of their teaching, you know them. And what are the fruits of their teaching? Whether or not their teaching lines up with Scripture. Scripture is the authority. Of course, if they are God's ministers with God's enablement. But as Bultmann, that's Rudolf Bultmann, he's a, a Greek, a German scholar in Greek. The real question is just this, in what form will the rule of the Spirit or Christ realize itself in history? Again, our starting points are Acts 20 and Titus 1. Only these are the sources of authority for the overseers explicit. In Acts 20, Paul attributes the appointment of the overseers to the Holy Spirit. In Titus 1, 5, 7, Paul directs Titus to appoint elders in every city, meaning we have suggested to appoint an elder in each city as overseer for the congregations in that city. The abrupt shift from elders to overseer is probably to be understood as introducing a person selected from those sponsoring the house churches. This person, already effective in his own household, must be able to help other church sponsors in the difficulties that tax their leadership. Now think about that. 
I mean, you can understand, you're beginning to see, I'm, I'm trying to show both sides of the question. You're beginning to see these are how the Roman Catholic Church and really a lot of the denominations today are justifying their ecclesiastical hierarchies. The Odox are going to be using these same arguments. The Lutherans use these same arguments. The Calvinists use these same arguments, although they're less hierarchical. The Baptists use these same arguments. I mean, you know, they're, they're much more diverse. But really, there's a whole bunch of denominations today. The JWs have an ecclesiastical hierarchy, although they don't call it that. There are a lot of popish structures out there. You can see where they're trying to get it from. But see what's missing? The basis. Where's the juridical basis? An apostle had to appoint the overseer. Paul was an apostle. He delegated Titus. So Titus is delegated by Paul to appoint elders. Yeah, but Paul's the apostle, not Titus. Paul dies. Who succeeds Paul? Paul is an apostle because he saw the risen Christ. If nobody can say, honestly, that they saw the risen Christ and he had personally appointed them, then you can't have an appointment of an overseer. Titus was expressly designated by Paul, but there's nobody after Paul to designate elders in every city. So you can't even go past the city, you can't even get to the city level with that apostolic authority. But there's no apostle after Paul. And obviously, if somebody is appointed by the Spirit, he's not going to speak against the Bible. So he's not going to invent things that the Bible contradicts, like the fact that there's no such thing in the Bible for apostolic authority, like the fact that Mary calls herself a sinner in the Magnificat, like the fact that at the end of Matthew 1, Mary had sex after her son was born. So somebody who contradicts that cannot be speaking from the Spirit because they're contradicting the Bible. Got that? Okay, so all of this would be true, all right. A person selected from those sponsoring the house churches, yeah. That's where, you know, you get the bishop selecting the pope and all the rest of it, the cardinals, really. Okay, fine. But that has to start with somebody who has apostolic authority designating who the bishops get to be for each city. Who is that person? None of the church fathers claim to have seen the risen Christ. None of the church fathers claim that they themselves had apostolic authority. None of the people who were in the cities that were given Monepiscopas powers claim to have seen the risen Christ. So where do they derive their power from? The basis for the power is not there. They're skipping. What they're all doing is they're skipping the legal basis. You have to be an apostle, and you're not an apostle unless you saw the risen Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 10. So all this is built on sand, not on Bible. And I think with that, I'll close, and you can go on reading the rest of this book yourself, because as I think you can see now, the guy really gets into the actual history of how all of this went awry. And that's exactly what Paul is tracing in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14, as I've been showing.